All right. Well, I might have to adjust the volume a little bit. How's the sound? I've never had music in the background. I don't know if it's uh, the best choice, but uh, I was going to give it a try. How about this? Is this good? <laughs> okay. You know, I know this is a weird... Uh, Eh, maybe a little quieter. A lot louder than I'm expecting, isn't it? Wish I could sort of hear it better. Um, actually, let me try this. That way I can hear myself a little bit better. Okay, I know this is a weird uh, title, weird topic. You know, normally we're playing video games here, but uh, I've just been seeing some things and thinking about things, and uh, it's time we talk about a couple issues <laughs> in regards to uh, my um, miners online. Have did any of you uh, see any news or information in the last couple days about uh, some? 17 year old getting into a tiff with a governor right i'm not going to mention this 17 year old by name because i don't want to be accused of uh bullying them but that is the uh the thing that's being talked about let me see if i let's go like this and then all right you can see paint on the screen, or paint.net. I'm sure you've all seen it on Twitter, or whatever. There's a behavior that minors who like to engage in politics will engage in, right? Here's our adult. You can tell because they got a big head. <laughs> and our minor has a little head. One of the things that kids miners, let's say, like to do is say, I'm only 15, and even I know X. So they'll use their age as a sort of, I don't know, pseudo evidence of the fact that their views are correct. <laughs> Which is insane, because it's actually probably the inverse that's true. Fifteen-year-olds are probably more in air about the world than, uh, I don't know, thirty-five-year-olds. But, regardless, a lot of the times when, uh, let me know how the volume is too, guys. I assume you're hearing me alright. Um, a lot of times when an adult pushes back, says, you know, you're wrong, you'll get this sort of uh, defense mechanism from the miner, which is, you know, you're arguing with a miner. <laughs> or I'm being bullied. Okay. So in one sense, their youth is like a pseudo evidence for their views being right but then it's also sort of like their defense like you're not allowed to argue with them because that would be you beating up on a minor right there are times where maybe you've linked scientific studies to a minor it's just someone you were arguing with right it's just a person on twitter you don't know who they are and you're like well here's this study it shows you're wrong and then they're like well i'm the minor and you're like okay <laughs> Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I, I I found a very interesting, uh, a recent example of a 17-year-old guy making political statements online and a certain governor um, or their campaign pushed back against this 17-year-old. And then the 17-year-old is now claiming that they're bullied. Uh, so, <sighs> I, I, 
I want to let you know if there's any miners listening, don't do that. It really, really makes that person look bad. And if you engage in that behavior, I think you could get in trouble. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Okay, I'm going to take down paint. I'm going to bring up a web browser. Uh, average age revolutionary war soldier. You know, if we look at the Revolutionary War, you know, like 16, 17, 18, while we, in the modern day, in our very sort of soft world, we think of those as, you know, minors, you know, like, like they're children to be protected. Remember, those would have been historically age groups of what would have been considered full adult men who could die in a war, right? 17. 17 isn't a child. It's not a little baby minor. It is a young adult man, right? So when you see some of these 17-year-olds or later teenagers claiming that they're being bullied by adults, it has a very weaselly stench to it. It has a very sort of whiny... <laughs> weaselly childish approach and to see such a childish approach from an older person is sad and it makes you look really bad so I encourage if there are any young people listening don't do that don't go down that road because that's this person that I'm thinking of I'm gonna I'm not gonna mention his name because again I don't want to get accused of bullying but, uh, and I know, like, YouTube bans bullies or whatever. If you do <laughs> uh, engage in political discourse and someone makes fun of you or disagrees with you or whatever, then go ahead and just take it on the chin and act like an adult, you know? Don't use your childishness as a defense because it'll make you, like, I think to some degree this person's behavior will follow them for years. Like people are going to remember and talk about their childishness as their life goes on. And again, I would link you this. I would post the, it's on Twitter, right? I would post the stuff on, that is on Twitter in the chat, but you know, I don't wanna get uh, in trouble. If you are on Twitter, maybe you've seen it, it's between a 17-year-old young man who's claiming victimhood for, you know, being attacked by a governor's campaign. And keep in mind, this is not like some apolitical 17-year-old. This is a 17-year-old that has like a big, like, they're into politics. And they're into arguing about politics. Um... But just in case, you know, I've had a few people over the years reach out to me for advice of various things. They've asked about issues. And uh, if there's any one thing I'd like to say to minors online, if you're a young person online, right? So, like, imagine that's you. And when I say a young person online, let's say... 35 and younger <laughs> okay <laughs> okay if you're in your mid to early 30s you're in your 20s or you're in your teens or your ones <laughs> um i think this applies to you more or less okay so here's you right and you make like an online account no more on twitter right and steam so you can play video games, you know, and some form related to an interest you have. Music forms, right? Uh, I would recommend that you don't allow any of these. Well, let's, let's do this. So, like, imagine someone goes out and they use their real name on all of these right their real name like it is very possible to trace who they are in real life to 
everything they've posted on this mu music forum, everything they've posted, everything that they've said in video game chats, and everything that they've tweeted. I don't recommend this. <laughs> I think it's a bad idea. I think what would be best is if not only, well, let's do white here. Not only you disconnect to the real you from the online you, I'd actually recommend that you disconnect the online you in all of its different forms, right? If there's a political online you that talks about politics, let that be different from the other online you. And I'd very much encourage people, people have asked me about doing things. So people have asked me like, maybe they should make videos about politics or make videos about, you know, one of their interests. They want to make music or they want to write poetry or short stories. If you have any inclination at all that you want to do something creative, you know, I encourage you to do it, but do it in a way where every online personality you create is completely separate. Let's see here. Games. Uh, what else did I say? Twitter. Let's say. Uh, I don't know. Stuff. Because what might happen to you over the next 10 years, let's say you come to the conclusion that some of the stuff you said or did in video games is very embarrassing and shameful. But your poetry is really taking off, and you might actually be able to make a career out of it. You will be able to, at that point, tactically choose to connect your life to your online poetry, and to make a career out of it, or making some big hobby out of it, or do something. But if, if not only if you don't connect your disconnect your life from all the things that maybe someday you'll be embarrassed of but you leave these separate things connected if you were to uh if you were to be completely disconnected from your online life but your online personalities were all connected if you then find huge success in one field and want to take credit for all the work you've done you're now stuck getting a package deal with all the other stuff like you went on to music forms when you were a teenager, and, and there's like a screamo form. I don't know, they, they, do they still do screamo? Scream emo music? Maybe you posted some things on a scream emo music form that like, like kind of makes you look mentally unstable? <laughs> it would be really sad to see a young person grow up and be in a position, let's say when they're in their 40s, and they're in a custody battle for their own children, and in court, because they wanted to bring their poetry into their real life, like in court, the stuff they posted as a teenager on these scream emo message boards came up in court to make them look mentally unstable. You, see, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so... If you're a young person, or you know young people who are online, it would be really great that if they did keep all these things separate from themselves, like you don't let people know what your name is or where you live, but also keep them separate from each other. So that way, later in life, you get to pick and choose which parts you want to incorporate into like what your coworkers know about you. <laughs> or especially if that stuff can get you fired. <laughs> so Cat in chat says he has been using the internet since he was four. Cat says he turned out okay, but he feels that there's a lot more stuff that kids can see today than he did when he was a kid. And that's probably true. Um he says that a lot of young people are exposed to various sort of ideas that may be harmful. I agree. There are a lot 
Well, you got to keep in mind, early internet. What was the earlier internet? For those of you who are on an earlier internet, the early internet was mostly like professional white guys. These were guys who were either into computers professionally and had some decently high level of intelligence for dealing with the technology they were dealing with or they were decently wealthy you know like there were people who weren't super into technology but they were lawyers and they could afford to have a personal computer and a home internet connection which was very expensive for your average person you know a lot a lot of people were uh Pat says it was a white ethno state uh, in to a large degree, the early internet was a bunch of white men, professional white men, um, and a lot of professional white men. While they may have had some ideas that were bad or whatever, and we could look back and we can say, "Well, this guy was a real weirdo," and you know, sure, most of them didn't have problems so bad that it interfered with their ability to live. Right? Most of them, like, in the early internet, it would be hard for you to find someone who's living off government handouts, but it would be easy for you to find someone who's a professor or a highly intelligent professional working in a technical field. Like, really easy to find intelligent people and not necessarily easy to find, let's say, drug addicts like heavy drug users if your drug use is like if your drug use was so bad that it ruined your life you probably couldn't get a computer back then and if you had a computer you probably didn't weren't able to afford the monthly internet connection fees especially if you had to pay for like one of the first connections in the neighborhood that means that a lot of it was over the phone instead of uh cable the high, the broadband internet that eventually came out with cable and stuff like that um, so on Twitch, Begot says, it's all political gamesmanship in regards to that young 17-year-old. You can't attack X, where veterans, minors, minorities, etc. is X, and attack just means disagree with. Yeah, that's totally right. And I think if you're a minor and you use that sort of, well, you can't uh, fight with me, I'm a minor... Uh, people may look back on what you said and say, gosh, that was just a person disagreeing with you. I mean, they were saying nothing worse to you than what you were saying to them. You're kind of a weasel. And again, that's I just don't want, you're a minor, don't let that bite you in the butt later in life. Don't, don't like it. If you engage in that behavior, people are going to judge you as kind of a bad person. Um... Mr. Jensen, Mrs. Jensen, <laughs> the, says the concept of the teenager was invented in the 20th century. Well, I will say there is like, you know, historically, you know, um, once you were old enough and, you know, you're but like, you know, you go to a baby, you know, why don't we have babies doing laundry? Because like babies couldn't, even, there's no way to get a baby to do laundry. They don't have the motor skills. They can't even hardly lift their, their head, right? Too heavy. <laughs> um, but historically, as a kid grew, as they got the ability um, to do things, they would be expected to do them, right? Um, oh, you can start performing this job? Well, now it's your responsibility to start performing this job, right? There was very much a just like, hey, you're like a small adult, and as you get older, you're just going to be piled on with more stuff to do until you are just like everyone else. You're just a full adult, and for a lot of, you know, that would have been happening early on. I mean, like, this kid 17 years old, <laughs> who, who we are talking about, I mean, my grandma was married with children at 17. I mean, she was a mother living with her husband, raising a family. I mean, and he's complaining about being bullied by a governor. <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. I mean, he is, in many ways, much... 
He's so much less mature than my grandmother was at his age. Let's just say that. Um, so the, the modern idea of the teenager, this sort of like person who's gaining a lot of capabilities intellectually and physically, but isn't sort of expected to act like an adult and to have the same responsibilities as an adult. That's, uh, that's, that is, I mean, I don't think it's new, new, but it's, uh, the, the current form that it's in may be new. Uh, Alander says they're teenagers when it helps them. They want to be treated like adults when it helps them. It's just, uh, like everything today, they want to take their cake and eat it. Yeah, that is the thing, right? Like, and people will do that as long as they can get away with it, right? I just want to say, if you are a minor listening, you might be able to get away with it now, but you also might be judged for it later. People might look at you as kind of a dishonest person for having done that when you were younger. Not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> Alright, let me take a look here. I need to look at uh, the chat through a different window. I want to see about... As long as they oh, jeez! Wait with it. The, the ch okay. They gotta get rid of these. Uh, hide user? <laughs> these, these spam bots, dude. I don't even know what they're doing. that work? Um, okay, there's that one. I don't know what's with these spam bots. Okay. But I mean... Uh, Rasmus says, Rebel Without a Cause also popularized the idea of the antisocial teenage outcast a trope which didn't really exist prior i don't know uh i don't i haven't seen it right and i'm like it's not that i don't believe you but i might not believe you <laughs> what i mean by that is most tropes that we think are new aren't new um is the disaffected sort of adolescent you know that in between of child to adult is that really that like, a, a, like did that really not exist prior or did that just like get more popular um <laughs> it is a little bit weird to me how we think of this sort of life as three stages now sort of child um teenager adult in a in a way like that's not all like you also have like the, the senior stage and whatnot but uh the idea that teenagers need to be with other teenagers have you seen that like people will talk about it when you when you hear about um what's that um oh. um homeschooling homeschooling kids kids need to be with their peers something like that do home cool kids seem to couple with their public school peers now i want to hear like i want to hear like i want to hear i'm looking for the criticism okay let's just say homeschool kids turn out weird All right i want to hear i want to see the perspective that some people push that homeschool kids um, turn out weird because they aren't spending so much time with their peers. You know, does homeschooling make kids weird? Will your homeschool kid be weird? Uh homeschoolers are weird this sort of idea that if they don't spend a lot of time with other teenagers that they're gonna end up sort of a goofball who can't socialize with others that being said personally I don't find that to be true at all 
some of the homeschool people I know have spent like so I've worked in professional fields and most of the homeschool kids had a much greater ability to interface with me than average kids right okay I'm gonna bring up paint again let's let's take a look at this yeah Will says they want to demonize homeschooling so kids get sent to public school to get indoctrinated. There's definitely some of that. But I mean, like, you'll hear what I'm saying just from average everyday people who want to make, who, like, who care about their kids, right? They just care about their kids and they want to, they want good things for their kids, so they're concerned. So, let's go with, uh, Homeschool, public school. Most of the homeschooled kids I've interacted with, their parents have really gotten them out socially to interact with lots of people. I mean, for one, I was a public school kid and there were homeschool kids on my baseball team, right? My, some some of the guys in the dugout with me were homeschool kids. So there was always an expectation that even if you homeschool kids, you're going to get them on the local little league or whatever, you know, the local uh, hockey team, local football team. But uh, I find that a lot of public school kids, when they're not in school, they might be interfacing with a screen, right, their phone or whatever, and homeschool kids will sometimes be doing the same. And But when they're not with their phone, when they're not sleeping, when they're not at school, sometimes they'll go hang out with their friends, right? So go into the mall with their friends. While I find a lot of homeschool kids are in an environment where their parents consistently introduce them to working professional adults. What do I mean by that? Like... If there's, let's say you live in a small town and there's like a small local health clinic and a, a general practitioner, sort of family doctor, a lot of times the homeschool families will say, oh, hey, doctor, whoever, why don't you come over for dinner? And this homeschool kid, rather than making conversation at the mall with his other teenage friends who are all dorks anyway, no offense, kids, <laughs> you know, he spends his time talking to uh, a family medical doctor or or his father makes friends at uh, the lumber yard or at a computer shop or in his work and in my experience as an adult if you go over to the homeschooled families a lot of them understand working life and adult life and speaking with adults much better than some of these public school kids. And the thing is, this homeschool kid and the public school kid are going to be adults for a long time. <laughs> They're going to have to interface with working adults for a long, long time. And the homeschool kid often, in my experience, has a decent jump on actually interfacing with those people about some of the issues that matter for a working person's life. Um, so this is two things. One, I want to say, in general, the stereotype about homeschool kids being weird, I don't buy it. Two, if you ever do want to homeschool your kids, that would be my advice, right? If you can, if you are in a town, try and find excuses to bring working professionals over for dinner so your kids can interface with them, right? Try to make sure your kids get to talk to uh, uh, journalists. Well, maybe not journalists. <laughs> if your kid gets to talk to a surgeon and, uh, uh, you know, a business uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, this guy owns a lumber yard, um, technical workers, guys who run uh, underground pipe or underground cable, 
all these different men and women working real jobs in the real world, I think that has a, a genuine value to homeschool kids. Probably better than being on your phone, generally speaking. Uh, Rasmus says that Morgoth's review has a good video. And it's called, Whatever Happened to Youthful Rebellion? Well, I haven't seen it, but if any of you like Morgoth, um, Rasmus recommends that video. Um, I know there's some delay on the stream, so I always have trouble understanding what some people are saying. So Jacob says, no, they don't. Pretty easy answer. I don't know exactly what the question... I don't remember what the question was. Sometimes I lose my train of thought. Michael says, can confirm, being homeschooled allows for far more free time during the week, uh, the week's working hours, and forces more interaction with the working world. I spent a lot of my youth helping my father with work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, so I was a public school kid, but what I described with homeschool kids that I see a lot of, I mean, my father would do at least some of that with me. Um, my father was a working professional of some sort and there were other people he would work with either in his same field or slightly different fields and he would find a way for me to bring him over to bring me over to their house or for them to come over to me so for one i remember there was a computer programmer who was working on systems related to his work who he would sort of consult with on business requirements and yeah I, dad built all my computers all our computers growing up and I've built all my own computers and so naturally when he made this friend who was a computer programmer and he had some reason to go over to his house into sort of his computer lab where he was setting up different stuff and like uh, uh, working on the systems for his field of course, they found a reason to bring me. You know, my father was like, well, why don't you come meet the programmer? We can take a look at some of the stuff he does and talk about it. And that was, uh, I feel like that's a good thing. And I feel like a lot of homeschool parents are in tune with how important that is, right? They know like, hey, this is a thing I got to do. And it is. It's a thing you got to do, whether you homeschool or public school. But it's, I just find a lot of homeschool parents take it a little bit more seriously. Jacob says he was answering the question in the title. Jacob thinks... Miners, what exactly did I put in the title? Uh, miners don't belong online. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a mixed bag. Obviously, there's a lot of cool stuff online, and there's also a lot of bad stuff. I'll tell you what, though. I've never liked the idea. Have you, have you guys seen those games like Club Penguin and whatever? Games that are like for children. Right? It's a game that's online where you're going to interact with people and it's for children. Those have always weirded me out. It seemed like a really bad idea. And even just talking about this is disgusting and frightening. But, like, I think there's a lot of gross people who try and get on those games to talk to kids. Is that, I mean, I ho hopefully that is fairly clear on why that would be. I mean, think about it like this, okay? How do you get a gun bunch of guys to show up to your bar? You own a bar. How? Well, it's easy. <laughs> you have a ladies' night. <laughs> you give ladies free drinks to get the women showing up, and then the guys show up. Well, how do you get... A game server full of pedophiles. You make a game for children. The, the, they show up to meet the whatever. Yeah, see, that's. I was always really, really bothered by games for children because I always felt like gross things would happen on those. If you are a parent, you know what I'd do? If your kids want to play games with their friends online, let's see here. Uh, make your own Minecraft server. 
That's what I would do. I'd make a little small Minecraft server. It's probably not that expensive to get one that only like 10 people can join or whatever. And just say, hey, this is for you and your real life friends. And either you, you spin one up on a spare computer in your house, or you get someone to host it for you at a few bucks a month, right? And if you get either way, as a parent, what you'd like to be able to do is look at all the different IPs that have connected to the server and look at the chat logs to make sure no one's saying anything inappropriate. But like, if, if my kid really wanted to play games with his friends online, I would really be like, let's spin up a Minecraft server to get the neighborhood kids looking at it, and I'll just find a way to make sure the chat logs are accessible by every parent in the neighborhood, right? That's what I'd do. Your own Minecraft server. And if your kid's a little bit older, helping you spin up the Minecraft server um, would be a fun thing, right? If your kid's a little bit older and a little bit more knowledgeable and you can talk about the difference between server and client, if you know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're doing, then you could sort of give them, give that to them as a study project, right? Like, here's your project, kid. Like, here's your thing. you got to spin up a server. And while if they want to get into tech or do anything in an office where they might occasionally be doing tech stuff, the I be able to put, I sound stupid, being able to put on their resume that they s have spun up their own servers using server hosting services for them and their friends. Like, I think you could write that on your resume, especially for a young kid. You know, someone's like 16 getting their first job. That's going to be impressive. Oh, you can spin up your own servers. Well, then you'll definitely be able to help us with your with our printer. You're hired. Rasmus says... The dilemma is that miners don't belong online, but everyone's online all the time. That's uh, definitely, everyone is on online all the time. Jacob said, he assumed I was going to bring up Minecraft right now. You mean Minecraft as a solution or Minecraft as a problem? Because I do think the little kids go on to like Minecraft servers and get weirdos talking to them, right? But... I think it's also a good solution because you can have your own servers. It's not like, again, it's like different than Club Penguin. Club Penguin and those sorts of games for kids, those that it's like ex explicitly for kids, just strikes me as weird. Now, I don't think of Minecraft as a game for kids, but maybe that's just me, you know. But that's because I bought Minecraft when it was back in Alpha. You know, when I when I bought Minecraft, it was just a bunch of guys like me by <laughs> playing the game. We're like, oh, did you hear this guy in Sweden? I think he's Swedish, right? He's he, he made a game based off of voxels. You've heard about voxels? Oh yeah, I've heard about voxels. Like, oh yeah, we sh that's cool. A Swedish guy made a game based off of voxels, like we've been talking about. I'm like, oh, and that it was just a bunch of old guys. <laughs> Well, not old guys, but there was quite a few. It was adult men to a large degree. Um, Kat says when he made Minecraft servers, it would just start as a private server with just a few friends he knew at school. Yeah, exactly. And that would be a great place. Like if your kids want to be online, but you're concerned that they're going to be talking to weirdos, private Minecraft server. They tell them they can invite their friends, but only their real life friends. Okay, maybe not their internet friends or whatever. Like, they know someone at school. Or in the neighborhood. Or, uh, Minecraft server for the neighborhood. Let's let's see. Because um, I remember back in the day, this was much more common. Uh, before Minecraft. Um, neighborhood game server? So, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's any images here. But... Uh, what used to be common back in the day when game servers, like a lot of games didn't get hosted on servers, they were peer to peer, or there were servers, but a lot of times the game server functionality was kind of used for lands and tournaments and not online a lot. It was very common back then, in my experience, maybe this is different for you. What would be common is you'd have your... the heck's my line? What? Well, whatever. No, 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 no. Oh, there it is. 
So you'd have your... I'm going to just represent a grid. You'd have your neighborhood. This is a town, city, neighborhood, whatever. And you'd have your computer store. And the computer store here would sell everybody computers. And if you wanted to get the latest Voodoo graphics card or whatever, you know, so you could play the latest Unreal Tournament game, then th this is where you'd go. You know, you'd get your RAM upgrades here. So we'll just write, you know, PC. And what was common was the local PC store would grab a couple decommissioned servers, right? And they would, like, decommission from a professional environment, and they'd throw, you know, Unreal Tournament on it or something. And a lot of the times back then, you know, um, every, most people who own computers were working professionals, so the UT server would be empty until it was Friday night. And then everyone would play on Friday night. Like, Friday night was, like, when, the, like, lawyers and dentists <laughs> and pilots and, you know, would all jump on their home computers to try and play Unreal Tournament with each other. <laughs> you know, and especially computer professionals. People who like computers, you know, a, a lot of them were on. Uh, you know, network professionals, telecom guys. You know, it's the telecom guys and the lawyers playing UT. And that was, uh, there was some sort of wholesome about this because it was almost sort of analogous to like a physical meetup place in a way. And they, in that way, like, well, if you go when other people aren't there, it's going to be empty. Like this server, this server was empty all week. Friday night, May, Saturday night, maybe Sunday night if Monday was a holiday. If Monday was a holiday, then yes. There would be people on the game server that the local PC store put up for you, right? They, they put up this server so that the people who bought, you know, their RAM upgrades and the, the video cards from the store would have a, something to do with the, the, that technology they bought. Like, well, you got all this extra RAM in this video card, then here's something you can actually do with it. You can uh, run a 3D accelerated video game. You got to draw a bunch of polygons. Um, Sneath says he grew up with Club Penguin. Okay. He says he agrees it's a strange concept, concept, but he never ran into anything weird. My parents did keep an eye on things, though. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Again, it's always weirded me out. It's always made me concerned. But uh, the fact that you got through unscathed, I mean, that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, Jacob says in 2009, in online games, he, he would run into inappropriate comments in public chat. And I don't mean cursing. You mean people are trying to talk to kids or something? Ugh. Um, oh, Johnny 5k on Trovo. Oh no, DLive says he remembers playing Duke Nukem in the school's LAN. Yeah. Dude, LAN parties... Land parties, we're, tr we're truly missing out. Where are the, where's the land parties? Let me go. Land party. Oh, not land. Land party. We gotta bring back the land party, bro. Well, they're giving the thumbs up and everything. You can show off your rig with all the RGB. I hate the RGB in the lands. I hate the RGB, bro. Look at that. Boom. <laughs> you gotta be this guy. Dude, Giga Chad with a CRT monitor? Oh my god. Who is this guy? <laughs> you gotta be the Giga Chad with the CRT at the land party, dude. You gotta. Don't be the don't be this guy. You know, don't bring your Apple MacBook Pro. Gotta be Giga Chad. Where the hell did he go? Giga, Ch Giga Chad CRT. <laughs> um, Cat says there was an issue in the '90s where people would play Doom at work, using the server computer's bandwidth and getting no work done. 
Uh, sounds like it must have been fun, though irresponsible. Well, I think there was various things like that happening. A lot of the tech guys in that realm, you know, especially if those servers were expected to just run the important stuff during the day, sometimes they put up things on those servers for Doom at, in the evening, like them and their friends can play in the evening when the servers weren't being used for business purposes, or they just sneak a new server on the floor, right? I mean, there was lots of guys doing lots of things, and some of those things were more irresponsible, and some of those things were less irresponsible. Some of those things were more sanctioned and more official, and some of those things were much less sanctioned and basically stealing. <laughs> but, 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 but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um Jacob says the people involved were more or less degenerate you mean the people with the the, the, uh, the doom on their server computers on their computers or uh, putting it up on their work servers well there was there has been an ongoing mission to get doom on everything right Nero says, surprise stream. Cool, yeah. So I just figured I'd stream for an hour or something. I don't know. And, uh, you know, I've kind of thought about, like, what if I did a Sunday stream where we just talk about some issue, right? Something, and just make it an hour stream. I was, think I was thinking about maybe doing more streaming than just the two days a week. Oh, um, oh, okay, okay, I get it, Kat. So Jacob was talking about the people who were saying weird things in chat. Nero doesn't like the music. Well, let me see if I can... Okay, this is Forsaken Ruins, that's right. How about, how about this one? Uh oh, this is an ad. When I first started Eve, I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let, me, let me get to the ad. <laughs> How about this? Surplus of rare artifacts. I mean, this might be somewhat ominous. Although I like it. We're going to be floating. Like you're floating. Just imagine. Imagine you're floating. Close your eyes. Floating. Burning. Like doing slow, soft backflips <laughs> through the universe. <laughs> I think there's more. Uh... How about, uh, well, we could do something more energetic. I just don't know which one of these are energetic. <laughs> well, I also wanted something that would like sort of fade into the background. How is my voice over the the music? Am I pretty intelligible? No one's complaining, but because no one's complaining doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> oh boy. Well, anyway. Okay, cat says the sounds fine. Um, I would recommend if you if you if if you know any miners online, I'd send them to this video. I feel like I give good advice. What do you think of my advice about? I I, I definitely would encourage people who are interested at all in um, engaging in creative endeavors. You want to write short stories? Go ahead and start doing it online. But don't link it to yourself right away. You could always find what you've done embarrassing or disgraceful and not want it associated with your real life. You might not necessarily want it talked about. Like, you might, there might be some point in the future where you, where you, where you might not want your neighbors knowing what you've written. <laughs> so, I think this is a good day and age to try engaging in creative endeavors, but we all know how often creative, creative endeavors fail. Like, most people who try poetry aren't going to go anywhere with it. Most of what they do probably won't be that good. Um, 
or certainly not groundbreaking. <laughs> Nero says, Nero says, I followed Embargo's advice. Now I'm single and working at Tesco. See? <laughs> Satisfied customer. <laughs> uh, Kat says, he hardly plays video games. I do a lot of reading nonfiction and watching documentaries. Real life is too interesting for me to get bogged up in fantasy worlds. I, 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 I don't know. Did you see my video where I said fiction versus nonfiction? Did you ever see that? Where I argued that, like, it would be better if we had more nonfiction and less fiction? Let's see if... I want to see... Well, what if I go onto YouTube and I type it out? Fiction versus nonfiction. What is my where's my video? Anywhere? <laughs> uh, no? I don't act I don't exactly remember what I titled it. God, I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere. This guy's got two views. <laughs> Uh, and this is the creative process, right? You go, uh, you make a video and you get two views on it. I mean... Whew. Okay. Fiction. Oh god. I was online. Oh god. Oh, uh, fiction is a joke. Nonfiction is great. <laughs> Will says shadow banned? Question mark. On some level, likely yes. Um, I think it wasn't. It was years ago that YouTube announced that um, borderline content, content that wasn't bannable but they didn't like, received something like eighty percent fewer views. It's likely my tag, my channel is tagged as borderline and as such isn't pushed out to many people. Um, but yeah, I, I have that video, fiction is a joke, nonfiction's great, which is like maybe somewhat of exaggeration. Uh, you know, I basically make the case in here that when, if someone attempts to write nonfiction, regardless of what biases they have there's always there's generally like some sort of kernel in tr of truth shaping it while fiction can just be wholly made up like you could have a story who is written by someone who likes the idea of polyamory they like the idea of free love loving everybody like oh i you know having this many wives and that many husbands and like we all just love each other unconditionally and they like that idea and they could write a fictional story where the characters feel emotions in ways where a human couldn't feel those emotions right they could write a story where jealousy is dealt with in ways that it can't be dealt with where jealousy doesn't happen where it would happen and that sort of story can influence people to think that something that is impossible is possible that sort of story can lead people to believe that they're going to be able to do something that they can't that they believe that they are a certain way that they aren't and fiction and nonfiction can both be subject to a lot of bias and but if a nonfiction writer is actually attempting to be honest they'll get often some sort of kernel of goodness amongst the bias one of the criticisms of the video that people provided to me they said hey you got to think about it though a lot of stuff is labeled nonfiction but really isn't nonfiction. There are lots of books where they say, well, this is inspired by a true story. And then they basically just make up whatever they want. You're right, they're right, you're right. There's stuff that's labeled as nonfiction that really shouldn't be, right? True. Okay, let's take a look at this. Um, TZI says he searched the whole title and it still didn't show up. Let's type in 
fiction is a joke. Oh, that that showed up for me. What if I type the whole title? Oh. It goes away if I type the whole thing. <laughs> is there some sort of algorithmic understanding of the comma in searches that I don't know? Well, anyway, type in fiction as a joke if you want to see my video. That one was kind of a, like, it's like somewhat serious, but not serious. This is one of my favorite books of all time, Two Years Before the Mast. Really great book. Richard Henry Donna, he was a, he was a graduate from Harvard back in the day, and he signed up to be a deckhand on a ship to go from Boston around the Horn of South, Af or South uh, America, which is very dangerous down there, and up to California and oh very interesting stuff I, I really liked that book I mean I like books about adventure and I really like nonfiction books about adventure right because those adventures actually happened you know someone will write a fiction adventure book and they'll introduce you to a character and they'll say like here isn't this character so cool and then they'll kill the character and they'll be like see look what i was able to craft for the reader when richard henry donna okay spoilers close your ears for 15 seconds when richard henry donna describes the death of his shipman on the ship it's because a real man actually died there around the horn It's not just a story. It's his life. Real. So I like that book a lot. I, there's a lot of books I like. One of the things I'd like to do, potentially at some point, is do like a big stream and or a video and talk about uh, Captain Cook and the various European explorers who helped sort of chart the world. I mean, the stuff they went through. What's that one? Oh, gosh. Um, men, long boat, lost, chart... Alaska. Oh, man. There was... This is new stuff. What is this? Bre breast milk saves 16 adrift at sea? Wow. <laughs> Something to keep in mind there, fellas. <laughs> Well, I forget who it was. There was a captain who was um, charting the coast of Alaska and the islands and whatnot. And he sent out these men to go sort of take measurements around some sort of bay. Okay, let's, let's, where's my paint? Okay, so here we have... Boom. Oh my god. <laughs> I can't write with a mouse. It is totally different than with a pen. Um, so here you have the ocean and here you have the land. Now you all know about tides, right? Tide rises, tide lowers. That's based off of the sun and the moon, right? This, this position of the sun and the moon makes your tides go up and down. So when you have a sort of a bay like this, the ocean goes up, right? So the ocean goes up, and the ocean wants to go the the higher, right? So like the o, so uh, let's see, O, B, right? So here's here's the ocean, and here's the bay, right? So the water's higher in the ocean than in the bay, so the water wants to move from the ocean to the bay but it has this little channel to get through. So it really rushes through into the bay, right? Like if you're trying, if like you're in a sailing ship and the wind is weak, the current might be a lot stronger than the wind and you can't leave the bay when the tide's coming into the bay, right? But when the tide is going down, water can really, really rush out of the bay. So you had this captain charting Alaska, and he sent out two men, or two, two longboats full of men 
to go around the bay and chart the different areas like go around here and put the plumb bob down and see how deep it is over there and look for rocks and you know put up measuring things because we need to figure out the exact dimensions of this bay and where it's shallow and where it's deep and we got to map it out so people can be safe coming in here right and he said like the, the captain's like hey uh you you're gonna lead this little out expedition trip to go chart the bay but stay away from the mouth of the bay it is so dangerous stay away well the young buck the young guy he was a very ambitious man and he wanted to sort of prove himself so he was going out there with all these men to chart the different parts of the bay and he's like well you know he's saying it's super dangerous and i know it's dangerous I, you don't have to tell me it's dangerous i know but i also know where we can be safe we can get really up close here we we don't have to hit the mouth but you know if we get up close here we can get more done so we're gonna do it you know he's he's being cautious and conservative and lame and, and we're gonna like we're gonna not put our lives at risk but do everything that can be done without shying away, without, you know, wimping out. I don't know what words I can say anymore. We're not wimps here. We're not gonna shy away. Well, those two longboats full of men got too close to the... close to, uh... the mouth of the bay. They got swept out to sea, and none of them were ever seen again. Those two whole longboats full of men. That young buck who was leading him, and all the men under him, I think it was like 15, 20 people, gone forever. Just gone. And those are the sorts of things you can read about. And that's a real story. I mean, that's drama. That's extreme drama. That is like, this young buck's got something to prove against the established captain. And... One of the most tragic things of all time, like over a dozen dead because of his, like, determination to be, like, better than the captain. Like, that's a neat story, but it's a real story because those families are missing their sons for real. I like nonfiction. And, and I know that seems like a weird story. You're like, gosh, he's so into the story. And it's like people actually dying. It's like, well, people like stories with lots of drama, which includes death. But why not honor some of the people who have actually died by telling their story? I mean, I can tell you, those longboats full of men who helped, you know, measure the coastlines and all of the islands and the bays, I appreciate them. They were risking their lives for real was no joke it wasn't just a cute little story someone thought that they'd make up to you know be clever Jacob says he appreciates Lord of the Rings fiction obviously for the series being derived from tradition uh, Jacob says it's also derived from Tolkien's religious faith, uh, faith traditional Catholicism uh one second here. Nero says, not sure to what point it was based on Catholicism. He was a Catholic, but the stories seemed more based on European uh, European folklore and paganism. Yeah, I mean, I can't... I'm not gonna break down all of the individual elements of Tolkien's stories because I don't even close to know all the individual elements of Tolkien stories and where those... Uh, influences come from but um it seems like there's some sort of appreciation for traditional pre-christian europe in there somehow you know folklore paganism in maybe in the same way uh snorri's uh what is it what's his name snorri um you know <sighs> codex regis isn't it or what is it so you have uh the poetic eddas right by you have this Christian in Iceland writing out the poetic Eddas based off of oral traditions of the pre-Christian faith in Iceland, right? 
think. Now, I think there was Christian influence in, in that, but uh, you had lots of uh, you had lots of Christians at one point, one point or another, right, who had sort of appreciation for pre-Christian folklore and Europeanism, shall we call it, and so, like, sort of merged the two or preserved one and added the other in different ways. Michael says it's even more interesting hearing these stories in person. He lives in Alaska, and everyone here knows someone who died horrifically. Bears, freezing, riptides, etc. Yeah, that is, uh, I mean, it would be great. I mean, imagine, like, the story I told about the young buck pushing back against the captain to risk their lives, and they actually all lo do lose their lives. That'd be a real interesting story to see if instead of this little drying, we were standing overlooking the bay. If we could see the little channel that they got swept out through and were never seen again, that'd be a hell of a thing, huh? Okay. Well, I only intended this as being sort of like a one hour for fun stream. I was thinking about maybe adding, you know, more streams every week rather than just the two, maybe do more, maybe bring in Sunday streams. Um, I might do like a poll on Twitter about the best time for streams. See when most of my people who like to hear about my perspective, like when they can tune in to listen. Now, Johnny Five Hay says you can't write about space mammoths without fiction. Well, that's because you have your sight set too low. If we simply make space mammoths real, then we won't have to write it about it in fiction. We'll just write about it for real. <clears throat> Merlin says Tolkien stories are based. Very good stuff. Very good stuff. All right. Well, again, I only intended to hang out with you guys for a while. I'm going to post on Twitter something about, like, when's the best time for you to watch if I stream more? Like, if I add an additional day, it's like... So, if you don't know, I've been streaming every Wednesday, every Saturday, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Wednesday at 3 p.m. And today, I started at 4 p.m. <laughs> exactly, Schmerling. <laughs> I'll probably put something on Twitter asking like, hey, when would be the best time for you to watch? If you're not on Twitter, I'm on there. If you're banned on Twitter, <laughs> maybe I'll put something on Gab too. Gab and Twitter? That's what I'll do. And uh, maybe I'll find more appropriate music. Maybe I'll find Space Mammoth Stream t soon. I mean, we've had a couple streams talking about this stuff. What's this? What this one? Trade routes? No. Yeah, this is fine. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I think I'm about done for today, though. I didn't intend on this being a long one. I know someone mentioned that um, um, No White Guilt might be streaming. So I don't want to overlap with him. If uh, you all have somewhere to go. Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't have much uh, else to say about Tolkien. I know you guys, you guys are maybe more into the various things he said. I think he made good stories. I really like. So, I've never seen the movies, right? I've never seen the movies. When I was a kid, my mother actually read The Hobbit to me. And um, I remember, so I never watched, <laughs> I, I maybe told this story before, I never watched the Lord of the Rings movies, but I did go with my father to The Hobbit movie. Where? Okay, let's bring that up. Bring that up. Let's see here. Edge? Okay. Hobbit movie. 
Yeah. Uh, was this the first one? Hobbit movie. Where, what was the first one of the thing? Unexpected Journey. Let's get a poster for this. Hobbit movie poster. Oops. So, again, I never watched the original Lord of the Rings movies, but, I, you know, my mother had read The Hobbit to me. When the movie, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey came out, I didn't know anything about it, right? I said to my father, hey, you want to go see this? It's The Hobbit. And we hadn't seen The Lord of the Rings. And we we're like, oh, yeah, I mean, why not? We can go to the movies and see The Hobbit. That was a really cool book. You know? So naturally, The Lord of the Rings was three books and it was three movies. The Hobbit was one book. Me and my dad are sitting there. It's like an hour into the movie, The Hobbit. And they're still at Bag's End washing dishes or something. Or they're throwing dishes around. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. And my dad looks over to me. He's like, holy shit. When are they going to get to the mountain? <laughs> Neither of us knew The Hobbit movies were going to be a multi-parter. We thought we were going to see the whole Hobbit. <laughs> and we were like, why is this movie so slow? They're not even doing anything. They're never going to get to the mountain at this rate. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. And I'll tell you what, I never saw any of the other Hobbit movies. <laughs> I just don't care. I mean, come on. Jesus, they milk everything, these bastards. <laughs> oh whatever <laughs> whatever Johnny says you can't make enough movie with just you can't make enough money with just one movie I guess not but they didn't get they didn't get any of my other money because I never went to their other movies Merlin says the best thing to come out of the Hobbit movies is the Denny's menu tie-in. Huh. Have you ever seen a Denny's across the street from another Denny's? Because I have. It's weird. I've I've been around the country, I've been around the world, as we've talked about before. Um, I've seen a lot of things and I always see news coming out of like North Bay, San Francisco area. And I remember I drove through, uh, Fairfield, California, and there was a Denny's across the street from another Denny's and one was super clean and nice. And the other was real bad. <laughs> I guess what it was that there was one that was like a franchise of Denny's and the other was like a corporate owned store like owned by the I don't know the Denny's corporation I'm not exactly sure how the Denny's franchise system works but there was one right across from the street and there were like I mean one was nasty <laughs> it was shocking how different they were um I really did like the nice Denny's, though. I don't think I ever had any, any of the Hobbit tie-ins at the Denny's. <laughs> uh. Will says they already pulled this trick on the Lord of the Rings animated from 1978. Yeah, I didn't see that either. Alright, well... Anyway, look for my uh, poll on Twitter and Gab. I'm going to be asking about when, I, if I do more streams, like a regular stream thing, like where I show up on a very specific time, every week, same day, what time would be good for people? I'm going to be posting it on Gab and Twitter. But I think otherwise, that's about it for me 
for the day. I'm about ready to head out. So, I hope you all have a good weekend. It's Sunday. You normally don't hear from me on Sunday. Normally you hear from me on Saturday and then you have all Sunday to yourself. You don't have to hear from me ever again until Wednesday. <laughs> but remember, you got to work tomorrow. <laughs> well, maybe. Well, peace out, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thanks for coming. And uh, I don't know how the chat works. I know you, I see you guys de debating the Tolkien thing. But when I end this, I don't know if you're going to be able to still talk here or if you're going to have to go somewhere else. But uh, I'm not shutting you down because I want, want to stop your argument. I'm shutting down because I want to leave. I got to go to the bathroom after all. <laughs> okay. Peace, everybody. Peace, peace.